adoption of container orchestration platforms is accelerating at a rate as fast or faster than any category in enterprise IT. Survey data from enterprise technology research shows Kubernetes specifically leads the pack in both spending velocity and market share. Now like virtualization in its early days, containers bring many new performance and tuning challenges. In particular, ensure, ensuring consistent and predictable application performance is tricky, especially because containers, they're so flexible and they enable portability, things are constantly changing. DevOps pros have to wade through a sea of observability data and tuning the environment becomes a continuous exercise of trial and error. This endless cycle taxes resources and kills operational efficiency. So teams often just capitulate and simply dial up and throw unnecessary resources at the problem. Stormforge is a company founded mid last decade that is attacking these issues with a combination of machine learning and data analysis. And with me to talk about a new offering that directly addresses these concerns is Matt Provo, founder and CEO of Stormforge. Matt, welcome to theCUBE, good to see you. Good to see you, thanks for having me. Yeah, so we saw you guys at uh, a KubeCon, sort of first introduced you to our community, but add a little color to yep. my intro there, if you will. Yeah, well, you semi stole my thunder, but uh, <laughs> I'm okay with that. Uh, absolutely agree with everything you said in the intro. Um, you know, the, the problem that we have set out to solve, which is tailor-made for the use of, of real machine learning, not machine learning kind of as a, as a marketing tag, uh, is, is connected to how uh, workloads on Kubernetes are, are, are really managed uh, from a resource efficiency standpoint. And so a number of years ago, we built uh, the, the core machine learning uh, engine and have now turned that into a platform around how uh, Kubernetes resources are, are managed at scale. And so organizations today as they're uh, moving more workloads over, uh, uh, sort of drink the Kool-Aid of the flexibility that comes with Kubernetes and how many knobs you can turn and developers in many, re many ways love it. Uh, once they start to operationalize the use of Kubernetes and move uh, workloads from pre-production into production, uh, they run into a pretty significant complexity wall. And, uh, and this is where Stormforge comes in uh, to try to help them uh, manage those resources more effectively, uh, in ensuring and implementing the right kind of automation uh, that empowers developers into the process, ultimately, does not automate them out of it. So you've got news, you've got a hard launch coming in to, yeah. to further address these problems. Tell us yeah. about that. Yeah, so historically, um, uh, you know, like any machine learning engine, uh, we think about data inputs and what kind of data is going to feed our, uh, our system to be able to draw uh, the appropriate insights out, uh, out for the user. And so historically, we are, are, we've kind of been single-threaded on load and performance tests uh, in, in a pre-production environment. Uh, and there's been a lot of adoption of that, a lot of excitement around it, and, and frankly, amazing results. Um, my vision has been uh, for us to be able to close the loop, however, between uh, data coming uh, out of pre-production and, and the associated optimizations and data coming out of production, a production environment, uh, and, and our ability to optimize that. Uh, a lot of our users along the way have, have said um, these results in pre-production are, are fantastic. Um, how do I know they reflect reality of what my application is going to experience in a production environment? And so um, we're super excited to, to announce um, kind of the second core module for our platform uh, called Optimize Live. Uh, the data input for that is uh, observability and telemetry data coming out of um, APM platforms and, and other data sources. So this is like Nirvana, so I wonder if we could talk a little bit more about the, the challenges that this addresses. I mean, I've been around a while and it really have observed, and I used to ask you know, technology companies all the time, okay, so you're, you're telling me beforehand what the optimal configuration should be and yeah. resource allocation. What happens if something changes? Yeah. And then it's always, always a pause. Yeah. And Kubernetes is more of a, a rapidly changing environment than anything we've ever seen. Yeah. So this is specifically the problem you're addressing. Maybe talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so we view what happens in pre-production as sort of the experimentation phase. Mm -hmm. And our machine learning is, is allowing the user to experiment and design and scenario plan. What we're doing uh, with Optimize Live and adding the, the production piece is uh, what we kind of also call kind of our observation phase. And so 
you need to be able to, to, to run the appropriate checks and balances between those two environments to ensure that what you're actually deploying and monitoring from an application performance, uh, from a, a, a cost standpoint, is aligning with your SLOs and your SLAs as well as your business objectives. And so that's the entire point of, uh, of this addition is to, is to allow our users uh, to experience uh, hopefully the, the nirvana associated with that because um, it's, an exciting, uh, it, it's an exciting opportunity for them and, and really something that uh, nobody else is doing from the standpoint of, of closing that loop. So you said up front um, machine learning not as a marketing tag. Yeah. So I, I want you to sort of double click on that. What's yeah. different than how other companies approach this problem? Yeah, I mean, uh, part of it is a bias for me and a frustration as a founder of, of the reason I started the company in the first place. I, I think uh, machine learning or AI gets tagged to a lot of stuff. Uh, it's very buzzwordy, it's, it, it looks good. Um, I'm fortunate to have found a number of folks uh, from the outset of the company uh, with you know, PhDs in applied mathematics and a focus on actually building uh, real AI at the core uh, that is connected to solving the right kind of actual business problems. And so, uh, you know, for the first three or four years of the company's history, we really operated as a lab, and that was our, fo our focus. We, were, we then decided we're trying to connect um, a, a fantastic team with differentiated technology to the right market timing. And when we saw all of these pain points around how fast the adoption of containers and Kubernetes have taken place, but the pain that the developers are running into, we, we found it, we actually found for ourselves uh, that this was the perfect use case. So how specifically does Optimize Live work? Can you add a little detail on that? Yeah, so when you, um, uh, uh, many organizations today have an, an existing monitoring APM observability suite really in, in place. Um, they've also got um, they've also got a metric source. So this could be something like Datadog or, or Prometheus. And uh, once that data starts flowing, um, there's an out of the box or, or kind of a piece of Kubernetes that ships with it called the VPA or the Vertical Pod Autoscaler. And uh, less than, really less than 1% of Kubernetes users take advantage of the, of the VPA, mostly because it's really challenging to configure and it's not super compatible with the, the, the tool set or the, eco, you know, the ecosystem of tools uh, in a Kubernetes environment. And so our biggest competitor is the VPA. And what's happening uh, in this environment or in, in this world for developers is they're having to make decisions on a, on a number of different metrics or, or resource uh, elements, typically things like memory and CPU. Mm -hmm. And they have to decide what are the, what are the, limita what are the requests I'm going to allow for this uh, application and what are the limits. So what are those thresholds that I'm going to be okay with so that I can, again, try to hit my business objectives and keep in line with my SLAs. And to your earlier point in the intro, it's often guesswork. Um, you know, they either have to rely on uh, out-of-the-box recommendations that ship with the databases and other services that they uh, are using, or it's a super manual process to go through and, and try to configure and tune this. And so with Optimize Live, we're making that one click. Mm. And so we're continuously and consistently uh, observing and watching the data that's flowing through these tools, and we're serving back uh, recommendations for the user. They can choose to let those recommendations auto automatically patch and deploy, or they can retain some semblance of control uh, over the recommendations and manually deploy them into their environment themselves. Um, and we, again, really believe that the, the user knows their application. They know their, the goals that they have. We don't, uh, uh, but we have a system that's smart enough to align with the business objectives and ultimately um, provide the uh, relevant recommendations at so, that point. So the business objectives are an input from the application team, yep. and then your system is smart enough to uh, ad adapt and address those. Application over application, mm -hmm. right? And, and so the, the thresholds in any given organization across their different ecosystem of apps or environment could be different. Mm -hmm. The business objectives could be different. And so we don't want to predefine that for people. We want to give them the opportunity to build those thresholds in 
and then allow the machine learning to uh, to learn and to uh, send recommendations within those bounds. And we're going to hear later from a customer who's uh, hosting a, a Drupal, one of the largest uh, Drupal hosters. So it's all do-it-yourself across thousands of customers. Yeah. So it's it, you know very unpredictable. I want to make something clear though as to where you fit in the ecosystem. You're yeah. not an observability platform, you yeah. leverage observability platforms, right? So talk about that and where you fit in, into the ecosystem. Yeah, so that's a great point. Um, we, uh, we're also you know, a, a Series B startup and, and growing um, where we've made the choice to be um, very intentionally focused on the problems that we solve uh, and we've uh, chosen to partner or integrate otherwise. And so we do get put into the APM category from, from time to time. We're really an intelligence platform. And that intelligence and insights that we're able to draw is because, we, because of the core machine learning we've built over the years. And uh, we also don't want organizations or users to have to switch from tools and investments that they've already made. And so we were never going to um, uh, we were never going to catch up to, to, to Datadog or Dynatrace or, or, or Splunk or AppDynamics or some of the other, and, and we're totally fine with that. They, they've got great market share and, and penetration, and they, they do solve real problems. Instead, uh, we felt like users would want a seamless integration uh, into the, the tools they're already using. And so we, 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 we view ourselves as uh, kind of the intel inside uh, for that kind of a scenario. And uh, it takes observability and APM data and insights that were somewhat reactive. Uh, they're visualized and, and somewhat reactive, and, and we make those, uh, we, add that, uh, we add that proactive nature onto it, the insights and, and ultimately the, the appropriate level of, of automation. So when I think, Matt, about cloud native, and I, and I go back to the sort of origins of CNCF, yeah. it was a you know, handful of companies, and yeah. now you look at the participants, it'll you know, make your eyes bleed. Yeah. How, how do you address Dealing with all those companies, and what are the what's the partnership yeah. strategy? Yeah, it's so interesting because um, it's just that even that CNCF landscape has exploded. Um, it was not too long ago where it was as small or smaller th than the FinOps uh, landscape today. Which, by the way, the FinOps piece is, is also on a, a neck breaking you know growth curve. Um, we uh, I do see, although there are a lot of companies and a lot of tools. We're starting to see a significant amount of consistency or hardening of the tool chain uh, you know, for, with our customers and, and, and users. And so we've made strategic and intentional decisions on uh, deep partnerships, in some cases like OEM uh, uses of our technology and, and certainly um, you know, intelligent and seamless integrations uh, into a few. So, you know, we're, we'll be announcing uh, a, a really exciting partnership with AWS uh, and, and uh, their, specifically what they're doing with EKS, uh, their, their Kubernetes distribution and services. Uh, we've got a deep partnership and integration with Datadog and then um, with Prometheus uh, and specifically cloud provider, a, a few other cloud providers that are uh, operating managed Prometheus uh, environments. Okay, so where do you want to take this thing? It's not you're not taking the observability guys head on. Smart yeah. move. So many of those even entering the market now. Yeah. But what is the vision? Yeah, so we've had this debate a lot as well because it's super difficult to create a category. Uh, you know, on one hand, um, you know, you know, I have a lot of respect for founders and, and companies that do that. On the other hand, um, from a market timing standpoint, you know, we fit into AI ops. That's really where we mm -hmm. fit. Um, you know, we are, we've made a bet on the future of Kubernetes uh, and, and what that's going to look like. And so um, from a containers and Kubernetes standpoint, that's our bet. Uh, but we're an AI ops platform. You know, we'll continue getting better at, uh, what, uh, at the problems we solve with machine learning. And we'll continue adding data inputs. So we'll go, you know, we'll go beyond the application layer, which is really where we play now. Uh, we'll add you know, kind of whole cluster uh, optimization capabilities across, uh, across the full stack. And the way we'll get there is by continuing to add different data inputs that uh, make sense or, uh, across the different layers of the stack. And, and uh, I, it's exciting. Um, we can stay vertically oriented on the problems that we're really good at solving, but we can become more applicable and compatible over time. So that's your next concentric circle. As the observability vendors, expand their observation space, you yep. can just play right into that. 
Yeah. The more yeah. data you get, could, because you're purpose built to solving these types of problems. Yeah, so you can imagine a world right now out of observability, we're taking things like telemetry data. Mm -hmm. um, pretty quickly, you can imagine a world where we take traces and logs and other data inputs as, as that ecosystem continues to grow. It just feeds our own, uh, you know, we are reliant on data. Um, so. Excellent. Matt, thank you so much. Yeah, Appreciate thanks for you having coming me. on. Okay, keep it right there. In a moment, we're going to hear from a customer with a highly diverse and constantly changing environment that I mentioned earlier. They went through a major replatforming with Kubernetes on AWS. You're watching theCUBE, your leader in enterprise tech coverage. Mm -hmm.